everyone. I'm Betsy Cooper. I'm the director of the Aspen Tech Policy Hub. Thank you for taking such a short break to come back and join us. Uh, the Hub is an organization that seeks to train technologists how to do policy. Uh, we brought in 15 fellows for the very first time. Uh, we gave them a four-week boot camp in how to do policy and build practical things. And then we actually gave them six weeks to develop something, to build something cool that they could then take into the world. And for the very first time, we're going to share that uh, with all of you today. Uh, so we're extremely excited to do so. Um, we also should note that this uh, begins the portion of the program around uh, practical outputs and how to move things forward. So we're excited to show you that you really can, in a very short amount of time, move things forward. So this isn't about me. This is about our fabulous fellows. And so I'd like to turn to each of them. So first, I want to introduce Stephen Buccini. Stephen is a software engineer from the state of North Carolina who actually ran for office in his home state. Stephen, take it away. Awesome. So again, my name is Stephen Buccini. Uh, I am a software engineer from Silicon Valley, which is why my interpretation of business casual is so different from everybody else's today. <laughs> uh, but in 2018, I, I left Silicon Valley. I returned to my hometown of Greensboro, North Carolina, where I ran for the state legislature. So I spent every single day knocking doors in the southern heat and humidity, uh, evading angry dogs and such, uh, asking people what was on their minds. And surprisingly, for me at least, a lot of people were concerned about election integrity. Uh, a lot of folks had heard about Russian interference on the news. Voter ID was on the ballot in the state of North Carolina at the time. So there was a lot of concern about what is the real solution to uh, election integrity. So during early voting, it came out that one of our old 15-year-old touchscreen voting machines uh, allegedly misregistered someone's vote. And as I was stumping outside polling places, people asked me about that front page story they had read in the paper about these, these voting machines malfunctioning. And I told them the truth, which was that the county board had quarantined the machines, examined that paper audit trail, and found no discrepancies. But I didn't tell them the whole truth that I knew as a software engineer, which is that any competent attacker, if they really wanted to compromise these machines, would not have left a smoking gun. These machines are full of holes. They're irreparably insecure. And uh, really, the only solution is hand-marked paper ballots. During the hub, I found out that the State Board of Elections in North Carolina would be holding a vote to certify new voting machines. So I examined the documentation. I found that one of the voting machines in particular I did not feel was sufficiently secure. So I did a couple things. The first was I wrote an op-ed to my local paper, because our legislative delegation in my hometown was universally in support of the existing machines. So I wrote an op-ed explaining from a technical perspective why I believe that was not a good position. I also wrote a policy memo to submit to the state board as an expert uh, given my background in software engineering, explaining why I thought uh, hand-marked paper ballots were the superior choice. And I'm proud to say that together with uh, several other activists in the state, we fought hard and we won that vote. The voting machine was not certified. Or, yeah, the insecure voting machine was not certified. Just kidding. Of course, no one wins their first race. Uh, no one wins their first vote, their first legislative fight. And we lost that vote by one vote twice in a row, which was super disappointing. It really, really hurt. But by this point, I was too deep into fighting for election security to just give up. And I learned in the course of my research that paper ballots are only really effective when you audit them. They're only really effective as receipts if you actually look at them and compare them to the voter's intent. So I focused on the gold standard for election auditing, which is called a risk-limiting audit, or RLA for short. You can think of it as quality control. Essentially, it uses fancy math to more efficiently sample the ballots to manually examine. Uh, and it's much more efficient while giving higher guarantees of security than the existing status quo in North Carolina. So no one was really talking about this. Everyone was really focused on making sure that we had secure voting systems, but those are kind of worthless if you don't have the audits. So I began a process of putting together a portfolio or a body of work to try to get RLAs implemented in North Carolina. I prepared a policy memo, which I'll be presenting to the State Board of Elections, arguing that North Carolina already has the technical and statutory foundation necessary to implement RLAs in time for 2020. Uh, I also found out that through listening to testimony and state board hearings and house debates on the floor, that there's only a really surface level of technical understanding when it comes to the folks making decisions. For example, uh, one of the state board members on our state board of elections said that barcodes are secure enough for voting because you use them every day in the grocery store. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you agree with that. I certainly don't. But um, <laughs> So I really wanted to make sure that I didn't just say, hey, RLAs are better and you should do them. I wanted to help them understand intuitively why they are better. So I have created an animated interactive explanation that will live online and people can play around and compare RLAs directly with uh, the status quo. And the final thing is that I'll be working hopefully with Professor Philip Stark out of UC Berkeley, my alma mater. Uh, who go Bears. Go Bears. Who is the sort of inventor of RLAs has published the most about it. And uh, we hope to build some open source tools to help local election administrators uh, conduct pilots so they can go to their superiors and say, hey, look, I just tried this new thing and it's way better than what we do currently. Can we switch over? So yeah, that's what I did this summer. In just three short months, we did move the ball forward. And I had never done policy before. I had done a lot of community organizing, a lot of software engineering. So I really want to thank Betsy and the Hub for giving me the opportunity to try to make a difference. Awesome, and you already have. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, next, I want to introduce Ginny Foz. She's also a software engineer and the executive director of Moving Forward, an organization which is pushing venture capitalists to do better in the Me Too movement. Take it away, Ginny. Yeah, so um, I started my work at the, at the Hub this summer thinking about cybercrime. And, and cybercrime is a topic that many have discussed on this stage today. But the topic wasn't brought up that cybercrime disproportionately affects senior citizens. And the, the stats from just last year, from 2018, that are put out by the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center are really staggering. $650 million were lost by adults over age 60 to cybercrime last year. And if you break that down per person, so for individual affected, um, on average, individuals lost $42,000 each. $42,000 is the same price of a brand new BMW 3 Series. So seniors could have bought a BMW and instead they got hacked or scammed. Um, and, and one of the Additionally concerning parts of the problem is that we don't even think we have a really good sense of the scale and scope of it because it's estimated that only one out of 30 of these scams ends up in any sort of government database. And so um, this summer, I wanted to think about how can we get more scams in government databases so that we know the size and scale of the problem and we also can be more proactive about finding cyber criminals and, and convicting them. I came to the hub from Uber where I was a software engineer and one of the main tenets that you learn in tech companies about how to design a great tech product is this philosophy that's called user-centered design. And the idea is that when you are building a new tech product, you should spend a considerable amount of time with the users who will ultimately be using the product and with them seeing their pain points, interviewing them, asking them about their experiences, you can partner and build something that really works for them. And so my first product out of the Tech Policy Hub was to do just that with the problem of online scams affecting seniors. We hosted a design thinking workshop for seniors. Design thinking is a really kind of sexy Silicon Valley term, but really what it means is doing user interviews and, and developing empathy for users. Um, so we partnered with three local senior centers in San Francisco. And we hosted this workshop in the basement. Um, we moved a ping pong table to the other room, and we had about 12 seniors attending. Uh, they had to delay their line dancing class by an hour to participate, so they were really generous to spend time with us. Um, and we asked them, what are the most frustrating experiences you've had online? What are the moments when you felt most unsafe online? How would the internet be better for you? How, how would you design it differently? And then we sat with them and tested the online reporting forms. Um, so the Internet Crime Complaint Center at the FBI has these forms that individuals fill out when they've been a victim of cybercrime. And the form is exactly as you would imagine. It's a white background, black text, standard drop-down menus, pure HTML. And so we sat with seniors, we pulled up the form, and we asked them to start filling it out. The first thing they say instantly is, oh, well, the text is too small. I can't even read it. <laughs> okay, so we, we adjust the browser so they can, they can see the text. And then, and then the way the form is designed, there are kind of these blurred out sections that will come into full color if certain elements of what you fill out higher in the form are true, then like you'll get a colored section to fill out more information about it. Um, 
And, and because the form was already kind of blurry because the text was already small, the seniors actually couldn't distinguish between the blurred out sections and the full color sections of the form. And um, the senior I was working with, Paul, um, he was, just kept clicking, like clicking into this blurred out section that's not going to respond, that's not how it was designed. And, and he spent maybe a minute or two trying to click on different elements, like pushing the, the mouse harder, just getting frustrated. And he actually got so frustrated that he shut the laptop and walked away. Now, Paul lives in San Francisco and he spent his career in the tech industry. So he's one of the most tech savvy older adults we have in our country. And even so, some basic elements of the form design prevented him from submitting information to a government agency. And so consolidating our findings from the workshop, we came up with a explainer on some design recommendations for older adults. Um, we're distributing these among designers and government in many different agencies, including the US Digital Service, which is an internal consultancy in the government um, on digital social services, um, and 18F, which does similar work. Um, because we think all designers and government need to be aware of some of the obstacles that older adults face trying to access their services. Additionally, we're going to be going to Washington DC next month, and we're going to be presenting a really exciting policy output, which is a brand new form prototype. Um, we built this prototype from scratch, and we've designed the form using the US web design standards, and the, the form will, um, it has a reveal logic, so seniors only see what they need to fill out. Um, and we're gonna be presenting that to the FBI as well as to nonprofits working in the space. Um, so it's been an amazing introduction of policy, and I'm really grateful to Betsy and to the Hub for, for putting this, this program in motion. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jenny. Last but not least, I want to introduce Aura Tanner. She is an educational uh, technology expert, and she's studying that subject as well. She's from the state of Florida and is already making a difference in that state today. Aura, take it away. Thank you, Betsy, and I want to thank uh, Aspen Institute for this opportunity to share my work with you. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the vulnerabilities that K through 12 schools uh, play in our critical infrastructure. Um, so in response to mass shootings that have been taking place in our nation's schools, policymakers have increasingly been turning to technological solutions such as AI powered um, surveillance cameras, facial recognition, automatic door lock systems, and even gunshot detection sensors uh, to harden our schools against another fatal gun attack. Um, an aggressive school safety measure was legislated in my hometown of Florida, or as you know it, the cybersecurity capital of the world, <laughs> um, after the Parkland shooting in February 2018 that left 17 dead. A uh, provision was mandated in that law that called for the development of a massive database called the Florida School Safety Portal, uh, which integrates millions of student records from state and local data into one single location. And so basically lawmakers said, the purpose for this database is to flag students who are um, showing behavior that may show that they are on the pathway to potentially causing mass gun violence and then intervening before they can act. Um, and I'm sure there's probably ripples of disbelief, like what? But it's a thing. So how does it work? Basically, the flag student's name is put into this safety portal, and then it's entered as a query, and then personally identifiable information is then pooled from social media monitoring data, um, Department of Juvenile Justice, Department of Children and Families, uh, mental health information, school disciplinary records, and other places, and then authorized members of school assessment threat teams and law enforcement look at this information and then use it to make a determination about how they should intervene for the student. Um, although the data supposedly cannot be downloaded, I still think it's very concerning that um, students' personal data is being used for surveillance and policing of K-12 students. So having so much student data in one single place basically creates a huge soft target for um, professional hackers who are adept at getting into um, 
governmental and school district systems. And it potentially puts the information of 2.8 million students at risk of being stolen, sold, or even held for ransom. And the database also has bias issues uh, where there's overrepresentation of students from minor minority groups such as African Americans, Latinx, migrant students, as well as students with disabilities. And more importantly, the safety portal, portal creates a vulnerability in the critical infrastructure locally, possibly nationally, because rather than just trying to access student data in multiple systems, uh, a malicious actor would only have to be successful at infiltrating one system with this database. So my project focused on accountability, transparency, and fairness within the existing system because it is a law that was passed and it does exist. And I put together several policy uh, outputs to advocate for improvements in the system. So for transparency and fairness, I wrote an editorial that was published in the Tampa Bay Times to bring awareness about the Florida School Safety Portal um, to the attention of parents, students, educators, and the general public in Florida. I also made a public comment at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Commission meeting that was held in Sunrise, Florida in August 2019. And during my three minutes presenting to the commission, um, I informed them about the technological and social implications of this database that had not been considered in the development of the database. And I asked them to consider recommendations that I had made in an operational plan that I made, um, which included easy to follow guidelines for oversight of the database, including audits for privacy, security, and fairness, um, developing protocols if the student data is hacked or leaked, also questions um, to ask the vendors who will be responsible for making this. The database um, work group commission, they liked my ideas, so they actually requested to have this operational plan that they will be reviewing and using for their group. Um, in addition to the three policy outputs I just highlighted, I also created other things such as an animated explainer video. Um, I have a policy brief that's published in a peer-reviewed journal and also writing a guest blog post for the Aspen Institute website. And I look forward to releasing these pieces um, at our demo day in Washington, D.C. on October 10th. Hope to see you all there. <laughs> so in conclusion, I'd just like to say that K-12 public schools have unique cybersecurity needs and we should see them as a part of the cyber ecosystem. Um, and we should all work together as a community to come up with innovative policy solutions to help meet those needs. Thank you very much. Thanks, so I wanna thank all three of the fellows and the other 12 who aren't here for being an amazing way to show that you really can move things forward in a very short amount of time. And I do wanna invite you all to our demo day on October 10th in Washington, D.C and in mid-November in San Francisco, so you can actually see all the cool things they talked about building. Uh, thank you again for being with us today.